I would just like to firstly thank you all for coming. Um, this is our fifth mm -hmm. Sharing Connect. Each one of them has been really special with beautiful, generous, um, informed, intelligent, creative guests sharing their stories with us about different elements of their practice. And the way we express as artists is so far reaching. There is not one way to mosaic. There's not one way to make art. Every single person does it in their own way and um, brings their own um, life experience, interests, gifts, skills, education to that. So I deliberately select people who are different and I deliberately select people who are at different points in their practice. Some have been working professionally for years, some are emerging, uh, some are, um, you know, towards the, you know, the, the serious later end of their art career, some are at the beginning. So um, that's really my intent. So um, our beautiful guest today, our special guest today, we have Heather Vollens from Canada. Do you want to wave, Heather? Thank you for coming, Heather. And we have Vicky Bush from Australia. Thank you, Vicky. And we have John Bodica from New Zealand. And welcome, John. I'd also like to welcome our two co-host moderators. We have Saskia Kremer from Sydney. I'm going to wave Saskia. And Michalina Bamford from Canada. I'm going to wave Michalina. Cheers, Michalina. <laughs> All right. Now, we are moving on straight away to our first guest today. Uh, and um, this is the lovely Heather Vollens. Uh, I did have a fortune to meet Heather a, a few years ago. And um, Heather is a... Australian Canadian you're you're we've got a couple of Australian Canadians haven't we yeah we do yeah yeah and I'm going to pose the question to you Heather um the question to you is why mosaic what is it about mosaic that offers you something different from other mediums okay I I, I think for me when I you know it, it's such a hard question to answer isn't it but um, I started thinking about where I came from and where I am today and what was that journey like. So I, I think for me, starting Mosaic was almost like um, a graduation from other things that I'd done because I did oil painting and decoupage, quilting, um, paper mache sculpture, um, all sorts of things that when I went to write my first artist statement for an exhibition and I had to actually really think about this, I realized that all of the things that I had done before were all about taking something, taking something old, something uh, reusable, something that was ruined and making something else out of it. So when I started doing mosaic, I realized that that was just a continuation of what I'd already been doing. Mm -hmm. So. I think mosaic for me, I mean, it certainly became much more over the years, but that's how it started. So it was, it wasn't until a few years into it that I began to, you know, really get excited about the possibilities. And for all of us, it, it's, it's really about that journey and how you've progressed through that journey. And, you know, you go off at a tangent or you go off in one direction, go off in another direction, uh, specialize or, or not specialize. Um, so I think for me, after I'd been doing it for a while, I realized that, oh my God, I, I have really grounded here. This is, this is what I've been searching for, for you know, 30 years before I even started doing mosaic because I realized everything else I had done was all mosaic related. I just yeah. didn't understand the connection. But now that I'm doing it, it's like, you know, I can't imagine even going back to another art form because um, the materials truly speak. And, you know, for me, it's it's purely about the materials and the mm -hmm. experimentation. The experimentation is really important. And I don't produce every good piece is not great. Um, and I think I said at the man's discussion, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's not great and you have to figure out what to do with it afterwards. But it's the, it's the journey and the experimentation that's the really important thing. Mm -hmm. And that's what I find with Mosaic that really, really fires me that yeah. I'm not sure I would have with anything else. Absolutely. And you have been through a process of distillation in your practice. Like you finally distilled whiskey. 
you've been you've been paring down you've been um making more intentional decisions around your materials and you the today's sort of overall topic is working with natural materials and each of the speakers today work with natural materials in a different way and tell us about that process of trying to focus in um well it's certainly a long journey it, it, it's not something that happens overnight it's you know, having having a, a dedicated studio time almost every day is is for me really important. And there are some days when I achieve something. There are other days when I haven't achieved anything, but actually I have because I've done some kind of exploration that means either no, I'm never going to do that again, or that's kind of interesting. What else can I do with it, and what else can I explore about that? And and that's what I really enjoy about. Um, working with the natural materials is, you know, you cut the stone, um, you, you know, you sliver the slate, like there's, there's often a surprise in there um, and including the smell that comes with it. It's, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's all part of the, it's all part of that package, right? So it's, it's the package of the exploration that really truly does fire me. And, and I think that's why now I think I've, I mean, I could change my mind tomorrow, but at the moment, I feel like this is where I should be. And mm. I, I'm totally fired by it. So, And that sort of feeling of this is where I should be, there's like a connection that you have. And I think you've described it when we were chatting earlier about a primordial connection. When you're breaking stone, you're working with stone, you're with the material. Mm -hmm. And you're trying, trying to create, um, there, there's a simplicity and a calmness that comes with that. And you, you described it as looking for, the, the, the simpler you get and the more, the, the more drama comes from the material itself. The material itself can have space to breathe and, and to show, show itself in a way. How did you come to that realization? Um, I mean, discipline was a lot of it. Um, you know, I do set myself targets in the studio if I had the luxury of just playing. So I always set myself a target for, you know, for this day or for this week. And I might say to myself, well, I'm, I'm just going to use this one material. I'm going to experiment with the cuts. I'm going to lay them differently. I'm going to try and change the background color, try to do something different. But all the time, it's about... It, it is truly about, it, it's really hard to describe, but the materials somehow tell you when it comes to natural materials, they tell you what they want. And, and, and I know there's some days I really struggle with what I want to do. And until I can get past what I want to do and figure out what actually works with the material, then I can't move forward. And afterwards I think, oh yeah, you know, how come I didn't figure that out earlier on? But you have to go through that agonizing, you know, it, it, it's a balance between the drama and the calmness. The drama is sometimes the frustration you go through with trying to do what you think the stone wants to do or what you want to do with the stone. On the other side, once you finally figure that out, there's a certain calmness that is like, that is truly irreplaceable. I, I don't know how to describe it. Um, I put something on my Facebook a few weeks ago about the, the way that stone makes me feel. And I really do think this, and any of us who work in natural materials probably feel this because stone has an energy. Uh, it truly does. And I feel it when I'm working with it. If I'm having a, a bad day trying to produce what I think I want to produce, and then I then I swap tacks and go and pick up some stone and just cut the stone, all of a sudden I'm in a different mental space, and mm. I, I cannot describe it. But it's 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 why I usually just work with stone now. Sometimes I work with other things too, 
but there's a space and energy and and a head space and a heart and soul space mm -hmm. that I'm in with stone that I don't feel with any other material I work with. And that act of breaking open a stone and then revealing the face of it that's never, ever been seen by hum human oh, eyes, no. you know, that's a real special thing, isn't it? Such a thrill, such a thrill. And then, you know, you think about, you know, who, who else has seen this? Who else has touched this stone? Well, particularly if you're talking with uh, about pebbles, and, and I'm sure John would say this too, you know, finding the right pebble, cutting it, exposing the inside, deciding whether to use the outside of the stone or the inside of the stone in your mosaics, hmm. or all of those multiple decisions that you make along the way all come from the stone itself. So you have to try and get yourself into the space where you say, not this is what I want to do, but let me open this stone up and see what the possibilities are and what I can do with those possibilities. So that's why I love, you know, my chosen materials so much because that's what it does for me. And can you speak about your kind of turning points for me a bit, Heather? Can you speak about those moments where you really had the ahas? Because I've had a, a few, I mean, in my, my practice, I think I can think about a couple of three or four ahas. I've got, aha. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's right. They all clicks for you. Yeah. Um, what were yours? And also your very special experience with your mentor, Dugald McGuinness. Mm -hmm. um, he was a major factor. The other previous factor I had was uh, about a year before that, we moved house. And I came from a 50 foot barn, which was my studio. And my studio has gone into a 10 by 10 room with a garage on the side for the storage of my stone. But my, my working space is tiny. So all of a sudden leaving this beautiful farmhouse, I had to decide, you know, what do I really want to focus on? What do I really want to work with? And I had like every, all of us, right? Mm -hmm. so many materials and I just had to color it and I'd been working with stone at that point by for about five years and I just thought I think it's just going to be mostly natural materials and so that's what I started doing I culled everything I'd been doing concrete work before figured out I was getting too old to carry those 50 pound bags of <laughs> cement around anymore and all the sand so I thought no the concrete's got to go and, you know, I'm going to get rid of everything else pretty much. So pretty much all I have left now is, you know, a little porcelain, lots of stone um, and some metals. So that's basically what I'm working with now. So that was the, that was the one thing. That was and a I forced found... reduction. Like, you know, had, you had to make those decisions. You had to sort of think, because we all collect. We're like bower birds. We, we collect and yeah, collect. Oh, I, need, I might need that and I might need this. And yes. maybe one day I'll work with that. And oh, why don't I just keep this in the case? And then you're sort of drowning underneath stuff. And then sometimes you can't see the stuff because of the, of the other stuff. And, and I That's suppose right. reducing it. Because also as mosaicists, often we, we don't want to waste things. We don't like wastage. We, we honour no. everything. We honour the rusty nail from the floor. We honour the yes, little... We do. The, yeah, that little cool. bead off the necklace that's you know fallen off you 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 honor the little gemstone you honor that bit of marble under the table you know you want it you don't want to throw things away but then again yeah. you you be, can become so overwhelmed with the material that you're you're spoiled for choice yes and I, and I do have to say when I was uh, sorting out my studio to move I found a lot of things that I thought oh my God, I've probably had that for 10 years and I've never used it. Am I actually realistically going to use it unless I have another life? So that was that was what helped me decide about what materials to get rid of. So, And that was a really good thing because when I started working in my new space, it was a, it was a very modern space as opposed to an old barn. I had a, a limited amount of space. The, the light is absolutely fabulous. And so I decided when I moved in, I was only going to have my absolutely essential tools in the studio with me. All of my materials would be stored in the garage. And yes, it is a pain to go upstairs and downstairs to 
get the material all the time. But in, in terms of a working space, it actually works so much better because everything's in front of me. So mm -hmm. it, it was a really good move. And psychologically, I think it was a good move too yeah. because yeah. seeing those materials every day gives me more possibilities of, of what I can do with them. Mm -hmm. If it's put away and you can't see it, then yeah. you kind of forget you have it. So. Yeah. So you can that see it, and I think I, a few artists have said that they need to be able to see it to then sort of recall what it that it's there and how they can use it. Yeah. And um, right. so you were the, the you were awarded the um, Robin Brett Scholarship, um, and as part mm -hmm. of that scholarship, you were able to access uh, a mentor. And can you tell us about that process? Oh, it was, it was truly amazing. I applied for the Robin Brett uh, 2016 and I thought, no way, you know, there's no way I'm going to get this. But I, I wrote a proposal that said I'd been working with Stone for a while, but I didn't know how to simplify it. I was At that point, I was still into more like mixed media, mixing other materials with the stone. And I really wanted to learn about the emotional process and the psychological process of paring down. And I didn't physically actually know how to do that. So that's what I asked for in my proposal. And it was just working with uh, Dougal McGuinness. I worked with him for a week at the um, Chicago Mosaic School. And I have to say it was it was a really tough week because I don't do well in a in a workshop environment. I'm I get very nervous when I'm with a group of other people learning. So I make copious notes. I don't often do very much in the workshop, but I'll go home and think about it and then I'll start mm -hmm. working on it. That's mm -hmm. the way after all of these years, I finally figured out that's the way my brain works. Mm -hmm. So um, this week was no exception. I was excruciatingly nervous all the time. Uh, I made a lot of notes. Um, pretty much everything I did for the first couple of days, uh, Dougal tore apart. He did, it the, he did the same with everybody. He wasn't singling me out, of course. Um, but I was really feeling threatened. Uh, it, was, it was really hard for me to, to work with the, the kind of structure that he was giving us. But by the time I got to the Thursday, like Thursday afternoon, and we'd done copious samples over the first three days, by the Thursday afternoon, there was this one particular moment where I, I don't even remember what he said, but there was, there was one sentence that I thought, oh my God, that's what he means. Okay, that's what he means. And by Friday, I was on fire. And I could have done that whole week all over again uh, with that new knowledge that I had learned. So when I came home, I spent weeks and weeks and weeks just producing stuff, trying to follow the instruction that he gave. And that's when I really began to feel a shift. Mm -hmm. it, and it was a, it was very much a, an emotional and um, heady experience. Mm -hmm. When I got to the point where I thought, now, I think I'm beginning to get an idea of what he means by paring down. So not only just one material, but, you know, turning the tesserae, you know, can I use it this way? Can I use it that way? Is there a little, is there a little spark in this one that I can make the most of? You know, are there streaks of marble running through it? Are there, you know, other indentations? Are there rust marks on it? Are there whatever? And it, it really, truly became about using that piece of material that I had in my hand and not dismissing it. And, yeah. and sometimes I would have a piece in my hand and I, I would spend five or 10 minutes just on the studio table thinking, well, this is such a beautiful piece. What can I do with it? Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to discard it. I don't want to cut it. I want to use it just as it is. Just as it is, yeah. You know, so yeah, that was what, a special, what a special experience and it, it you know, it's really great that you've had that opportunity. I, I also was a, a scholarship recipient and it was made a big deal. Yes, it was well, a huge yeah. deal for me as well. And I also went to the Chicago Mosaic School um, to learn. And, um, you know, I really understand that immersive experience and, and how valuable those immersive experiences are. 
So Heather, thank you so much for sharing your um, your story with us today. It's been you're just, very welcome. Uh, and you, you know, you're so honest as well. You're really open. Um, you're really <laughs> oh, open I'm and you're right. vulnerable and you you're sharing how how you felt how you felt. And I think this is such a valuable thing to hear for people to hear because often people are feeling nervous or they're feeling anxious or they're feeling unsure or they're are feeling overwhelmed with their mosaic and and hearing you share in this way I think it's um a real a real comfort uh, yeah, and, and, it uh, is. and it's and, and I don't think it's an easy journey for any of us right there's no. three steps forward and four back and another three forward and another one back and yes yeah, we've all thrown out a lot of work right absolutely <laughs> okay thank you Heather thank so you. thanks we, everybody it's great to see you all now um before we move on to Vicky, um, Saskia has one of our co-hosts has been um, collecting questions, and I think um, Saskia, there were some questions for Heather. Is that right? We have a, a lovely yeah, question what? from Linda Wise, okay. um, and Linda would like to. Um, um, she was struck by the statement, uh, um, Heather's statement about the natural materials. Um, and Heather, would you like to sort of expand a little bit more about um, about um, how these materials tell you what they want? <laughs> it's really hard. It, it's it's really hard to explain it. I, I I can only say it's like the the sitting of the materials on the studio table and cutting that stone open. Is, is how it all begins. And, and sometimes I sit with a piece of material for like a week, two weeks, sometimes longer, mm. figuring out what I should do with it. But when, I've, when I think I finally figured it out, I either feel good about it or I don't. And if I feel good about it, then I tell myself that's what the stone wanted. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. It's it's a really hard thing to explain. It's it's emotional more than anything. Interesting. It's like if you build up that or create some sort of a intuitive connection with that material as you have it in your presence, and then it sort of evolves from that. Yeah, and and it doesn't happen quickly. Mm. You know, which is why that studio time is so important. That that dedicated studio time is, uh, and also why some days you feel satisfied and some days you don't. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that happens with any material, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, sometimes I can spend a lot of time just thinking. I dream about it or I think about it while I'm making dinner or whatever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> My husband says I'm off with the fairies most of the time anyway. <laughs> <laughs> how wonderful yeah, you, have to pick your, you have to pick your audience you have to pick your audience we're all yeah. obsessed we can just try yeah, that's right. day non-stop and people get a bit tired yeah. of us sometimes yeah, yeah. enough now <laughs> your comment about can i share a comment too yes um i just in that the same vein of that question i was when you said that i also was struck um as linda was and I know a lot of like stone sculptors that are working with, you know, there's a lot of sandstone where I live and they really believe that there is something in the stone that you're really just sort of the channel that reveals yep. it, you know, so I think I, that, there's I, a, that, that is common with like yeah. sculptors of stone yeah. for sure. I, I, I truly believe that about stone. Yeah, I do. Yeah, absolutely. And um, and to that effect as well, I was just having this conversation the other day with a friend who he just is a big geology buff and loves uh -huh. stone. And he was saying that, um, you know, stone actually has a spirit mm -hmm. that a lot of sort of ancient traditions believe that it it actually holds the qualities of consciousness. And yeah. so it's a spiritual material to work with. You know, it has like this birth and this evolution and it has a consciousness. And so it doesn't surprise me that, yeah. you know, you feel mm -hmm. something so magical or special because it really is like working with a spirit, not just, yeah. you, know, and if, you know, we've, in our society, we've really gotten away from those, uh, any kind of connection with nature. Right. So mm. yeah, it's, it's a wonderful feeling. I tell you. It is. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Heather. We're going to Vicky Bush now. 
Vicky, welcome. You've had such an amazing mosaic journey, haven't you? You've been the the, you. the real mm-hmm. so diversity of your learning experiences and how you've accessed different types of mosaic and different materials and different techniques and you know you're really an example of someone with cumulative knowledge you know because you've you've, <laughs> you've, you've learned so much you know you've um been immersed in smalty you've been immersed in stone you've been traveled you've traveled overseas numerous times you've um mm. had a number of mentors and and how ha- i guess one of my key questions of course to you is why mosaic well before I answer that question, Caitlin, I just want to say, wow, to Heather, like your presentation, your words, sorry, sorry to divert, Caitlin, but your yeah. presentation, Heather, your words, your feelings, all of those things, I couldn't stop nodding my head. I was like this, because you expressed absolutely everything that I feel when I look at my stone and play with it and cut it up and, and all of those things. Uh, I couldn't have asked for a better introduction or person before me to express everything how I feel. But going oh, back to, thank you. Uh, I'm glad I mean, you share it's it. Just, it's I I share that feeling, and I was like, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> but, <laughs> thank but sorry, you. Caitlin. Going back to why mosaic? I don't know why mosaic, but you know, going back nine years ago now, when my husband said you need a hobby. And I thought, (laughs) God, what am I going to do? And, you know, he connected me um, to Caitlin uh, to attend one of your courses. Yeah. This is going back pre the big bushfires. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where it, it just, it was something that I did I connected with it. I loved it, fell in, fell in love and just wanted to create, had a thirst for it, wanted, dreamt about it, you know, played with it, looked at other mosaics, you know, Pinterest became like the oh, obsession of what, what else can I create? What else can I make? Um, I don't know why mosaic, but it was just something that was so, so different um, and exciting and tactile and just being able to to do all of that sort of stuff and and I fell in love with it and you know these these yeah it was a material and a method that connected with you straight away I mean absolutely you're one of those students like I I was a bit like that too like the first class you start and you go okay well my first class and you get your first project (laughs) and you come back week two and it's finished (laughs) yes that was me finished And then in the, te- you know, I did this to my teacher too. I first, she started me off first lesson, came back second lesson, finished it. I hadn't learned anything properly yet, but I'd finished it. I was just completely, absolutely hooked. And you like that. You came the first lesson, you were doing, I think it was irises or something. Or yeah, yeah. The, the second lesson, violets, the same lesson, second day you came back, completed next project. And, and, and you really have never stopped. Oh, It's just absolutely. been an, an evolution of, of um of, of this of continual learning for you and um but before we get to talking about your particular connection with natural materials and your particular connection with place and land um tell us a bit about the evolution of your learning experience because I think for for students who are and mosaic artists who are all over the place that that learning is you know you've had such diverse learning there's not one way to mosaic there's not one way to learn there's not one right teacher yeah that's right accumulation of of knowledge from all over the place so can you tell us about that Vicky I mean basically well once I you know I started the courses and the classes with Caitlin um and then I had wonderful opportunities that came across and that was you know I had man's Um, which was a great way to connect with other like-minded people. Um, I went to courses and workshops. I think I went to a a Marion Shapiro uh, workshop about two weeks after I had started Mosaics. And it was like, oh, my gosh, 3D stuff. What else can I create? Um, So there was, you know, the friendships and the other people that I met through Mosaics, and it just drew me in. I wanted more of that. Um, so yeah, it was my, my experience sort of just started locally. And then, 
you know, I, I, because of, you know, the connections through symposiums, through exhibitions, um, through the, just the Mosaic community, I got to go overseas um, with the inaugural Helen Bodicum uh, group, and that was going to um, Italy. And wow, that was the beginning of everything for me that opened up so many experiences, so many um, beautiful, beautiful mosaics to look at. Um, we went to, you know, looking at the, the histories. So we went to Venice, Aquileia, uh, Ravenna, Spilimbergo, all of those places just triggered so many, I don't know, hungers, I guess, just wanted to learn how people were using the materials and and, and I, I think that's that what you say is really important and I know some other people in this gathering today were able to attend one of the tours with Helen and um I think being where we are in Australia we you know we have this it's a we feel we're isolated in some ways it's, it's yes. a sort of dichotomy you've got this sort of isolation mm. where we we do not have institutions for mosaic learning such as the Spielberg Mosaic School or the Mosaic School of uh, Mosaic Ravenna or um, you know Studio Castillo in Rome or any of those we don't have that we don't have that history tradition here where we can go and immerse ourselves in in thorough learning we don't yeah. but, but but what we do have is freedom that's true because we don't have any we have complete freedom we don't have anyone saying no you must not do this and you must not do that and you must not set up this and you must not set we have freedom so um but i think it's been really important for you and also for me and many others to go there and then to experience some of that learning and Absolutely. to view those sites and to view and really immerse ourselves in that the history and and and, and the ancient language that we're working within so what were your key moments in those in those trips? Can you give me two highlights? What were oh, your big, two, big, big two highlights in your, in your traveling, traveling education? I think, well, firstly, the connection. Okay, one, one of the key moments uh, was Sardinia for me, um, being able to work with uh, Julia Minossi um, at the symposium, but also meeting the other international students. So there was 10 of us. And that brought together the whole entire kit and caboodle package for me, mosaics, something that I love doing, drinking and celebrating with <laughs> lots of people, the culture, um, the history. It brought everything together in a nutshell and I just wanted to do more and more of it. Mm -hmm. I think I was, you know, exploring with, um, exploring the ways that other artists work internationally was such an eye-opener as well um, it was such a learning experience so that was that was one key um, key experience and I also think going to Spilimbergo the first time in 2017 that was um, I, all I can say is if you've never been to Spilimbergo make it a point one day in your life to try and get there um, the, the walls are adorned by the most incredible artworks. And when you look at them, you, you get this, I don't know, like a, it is, it's a thirst, it's a hunger, it's a, I want to create like these people. I want to use those materials that, that everyone else does. But it also just expands that, that, that smorgasbord for you to be able to go, Oh, wow. Okay, so they use glass. Oh, they use paper. They use rocks. They use marble. And, you know, all the different ways that they use all the test ray, it, it sort of makes you sort of go, oh, well, I can do that. And that's what you do. You start to, you start to work with different materials and, and concentrate on different methods. And then that's how I began and, and, and started to move closer towards working with natural materials. I found that, that I had a a more instinctual love for those materials. They kept, it was, it was what I was searching for more and more um, as I sat at the table and went, okay, so I've got all this pretty glass and pretty um, uh, pizza and all sorts of things. And um, this was actually the beginning for me, my turning point um, in working with natural material. And it was at um, a workshop that Rachel Bremner did 
um, held or hosted uh, at Caitlin's studio at Woodford. And I went along, had no idea what I was going to do. No, I, you know, basically sat there in, in the workshop and said, wow, what am I going to create? And so Rachel came along and she said, all right, give me three pieces of what you've got on your table. And she literally stuck them on the board on my substrate. And she said, those pieces are not going to move. You are going to create around those pieces that I've placed on there. You can do whatever you want, whatever formation, use whatever materials, but those pieces must stay there. And they were the three natural pieces. Um, and that was the most fun I had had. It was like a challenge. Mm -mm. Someone's placed three things on there. I've got to make it look good now. <laughs> and um, I actually really fell in love with it. I fell in love with playing with turning the, you know, the tessera, the rocks, the slate, all those things around and trying to create mm -hmm. something different. Um, and that was actually my turning point of when I said, wow, this is what I want to do. This is the stuff I want to play with. This is the, the materials I want to use going forward. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, I started to, to look at even, you know, creating some of the, the coils and, you know, using uh, ceramics um, to create different variances, different heights, different textures. Um, yeah, so this, I this to... work here really speaks as well to your overall conceptual investigation and the subject yes. matter. So you've got Rachel's experience where you're you've been you've been asked to solve a problem. Yes. Is that okay? Here we go. I'm just going to stick these on your substrate. Yep. Now you have to visually solve this problem. And you did. And then, but this piece here really is a bit of a departure from that because this is about something. Yes. It's about a place. And I think place and land has become, not only the materials from that land, but then the, the idea of place has become a key thing in your work as well as aerial views. Absolutely. And what, what Caitlin said there is very true. And it actually started from, um, you know, my travels, looking out the window, you know, being on the plane on your on your own, you look out the window and you go, oh, what a gorgeous mosaic. You know, look at the world from a, you know, looking at the world from above and looking at the ground below. And I was like, but I could create a mosaic. I could, I've got all those materials. I've got green glass. I've got blue glass in my studio and I'd get excited. Mm -hmm. And all these little things would, you know, dream away in the plane. And that's where I started to, you know, sort of think about, wow, well, maybe I should do that. I went on a balloon mm -hmm. ride, for goodness sake, <laughs> and look at the pictures, like yeah. they're mosaics. Um, and I thought, well, I'm going to use these as inspiration. I want to show, um, I guess, abstractness in my um, mosaic, but, you know, using the colours and the different textures and the natural material to, to show the different undulations and and yeah I, I started to create um, mm -hmm. from the things that I was seeing from above then I went into aerial pictures mm -hmm. um, and started looking at you know just inspirational pictures that and I went oh wow I could create a mosaic out of that I've got beautiful stone that symbolizes this or beautiful glass or fruit or you know, and, and that's where I got excited about doing these um, these connections with the um, with the land. You know, mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. those sorts of pieces, and you know, even to the point that I'll have to say, <laughs> this is going back about two months ago. I sat there and watched the first episode of Survivor Australia, and I saw this absolutely gorgeous aerial photo. And photography does do it for me. It gets gets my uh, it gets me excited to see photography from above, and I go, oh my gosh, I could create that with the materials I have, you know. Um, and I was looking at this this first episode, and I went, what a gorgeous land we live in, you know. Um, look at the views from above, and I literally in my mind walked straight out after the show, did a little sketch drew some arrows, colours, blah, blah, blah. And I think in about two days, I had a, um, 
my my mosaic finish because it just I wanted to get it you know mm-hmm. I wanted to transport everything that I had seen in that image from that survivor episode onto a mosaic and I just went away and worked on it furiously for two days mm-hmm. and and that was it but mm-hmm. you know unfortunately I don't get the time um more recently I haven't had the time actually to to do as much mosaic as I would have liked to I've I've been working a bit but um well at the end of our at the end of today I'm going to ask each of the presenters as to the question is what's next for you so I want you to think about that and think about how what what your next next project is going to be Uh, thank you so much Vicky for sharing all this with us today thanks Caitlin thanks everyone you're you're absolutely fantastic example of the diversity of learning and the diversity of your experiences and how <laughs> I suppose, but as you said, it's nine years. Nine years. And away. you know, there's this distillation that's happening. And I think that's what Heather was talking about as well, is that you you're doing all this stuff, learning, having all these learning experiences, and then it's about bringing those together and bringing them in. You know, what is it that you're actually wanting? What is yes. it that you're personally wanting? Yes. You've got the techniques, you've got the skills, you've understood the materials, you've got the undermento, you understand cutting, you understand adhesives, you understand substrates, you understand sculptures, you understand form. What are you going to do with all that knowledge? Yeah. And what how, you? how are you going to do it in your own way? Yes. That expresses something that you want to say. What speaks to you? That 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 what speaks to you is just amazing. You know, one of the things that um, Heather did actually uh, say was, you know, like the materials they do, they tell you, they tell you, you, you know, what they want. And that's what I've noticed that when I look at those natural materials on my table, I look at them, I play with them, I throw in a little bit of something else, but it's those natural materials that always call me back mm. and make me want to, you know, they make me really really excited about creating more and more stuff like that and I guess that's why I've gone with that natural theme the Mm -hmm. the connection to the land looking from above Mm -hmm. all of those things yeah Yeah. perfect thank you so much Vicky thank you Caitlin now we are going to our very special guest John Vodica and John what a pleasure I'm so so happy that that you are here with us um I have only met you once and that was briefly at the symposium in Canberra in 2019, which seems like a lifetime ago now. But firstly, the key question I have for you is why Mosaic? What does Mosaic offer that other art forms don't? So, John, why Mosaic? Well, it's a purely purely what happened to me. It's just accidental. So I really cannot talk about it because... I was not preparing myself for this journey. Uh, it just happened. And uh, of course, there are some uh, things that are related to it, to my journey present one. And it's always uh, uh, that I was infatuated by beautiful objects, uh, be it furniture, be it clothes, be it surroundings. And, you know, I try, try to interpret uh, those, those facets from my art right now. Yeah, so it's basically purely, purely accidental, no preparation whatsoever. And you, you fell into this practice. You, you were experimenting and you were introduced to it. Uh, and then you, you know, it's something that really gelled with you. you. There must have been this moment where the connection with pebbles, it just blossomed. And, you know, my God, you're so prolific. I've got a a selection of your work to show. I think I've got 45 slides and that's only a fraction of your work. And your work is huge. We are not talking about a small mosaic. We are talking about several meters and so many pieces and so much material and physical labor. And you must be absolutely passionate about this to to be able to continue in, in this way. Yeah, it's, it's a very important issue right now because it's becoming a business, you know what I mean? So, you know, how do you remain focused? How do you remain passionate about what you're doing? You know, so th- those are very challenging times in a way. But whenever I go back to my studio, this is where I find my... Uh, 
freedom, where I find my happiness. So this is basically it, you know, this is my life. And I could not imagine uh, doing anything else right now, or will never imagine anything uh, alternative to this, uh, it's impossibility. And how do you find your pebbles? What, what makes the right pebble the right pebble for you? Well, I, I collect them all the time. I select them, collect them, uh, look for special sizes, for special thickness. Uh, so in itself, it's a very, very uh, intricate work. You know what I mean? Selecting pebbles and it takes a long, long, long time. So yeah, it is becoming a routine all of a sudden. And like I say, you have to stay focused because the project that I'm working right now for the background I have to select pebbles from a pile and it's a really a lot of lot of hard work really your, your back is hurting everything is hurting and you just say I had enough but then you continue you know that's right and you you uh, you are physically hand selecting it's not like a truck just turns up with here's a box here's your material like you know so for no. those of you who are working with other materials, you order a material and it comes in a, in a box and you unwrap it and there you go. Whereas it's very different for you because no one pebble is the same and uh, you're looking for a particular formation, you're looking for a particular feeling and it must be so interesting to... Um, the experience of selection, right? is almost, I imagine, would become intuition. Which, which pebble in this huge pile of pebbles is the right pebble? How do you know that one's the right one? You, you instinctively become tuned in to a exchange with that material to, to instinctively collect and select the ones you need. And, and that must be not only physically laborious, which is what you're talking about, the, the physical labor involved, but again, you say focus, you have to be focused. It's not just, you can't just select anything. It's um, a special thing. Each one is especially chosen for the project. Is that right, John? Yeah, well, this, but I have to add right now that I'm not as selective as I used to be. You know what I mean? In the beginning, I was, it was kind of immaculate, you know, to pick up the really this one and this one. But it's not the case anymore because now I'm, I've got uh, more routine, uh, you know what I mean? So I can uh, practically use any pebble, so to say. Well, that's an exaggeration in itself, but, you know, so because I trust my expertise, if I can call it right now, and that's basically it, yeah. And, um, yeah, well, I think you've developed that expertise. It's It's not something that you just have it's something that you've worked towards that you've trained and honed not only that if we look at this particular these images at the moment where we're looking at here with um the uh production methods in this is a you're working with a with an ancient technique here and yeah. the, these are big pieces so how we're looking at the dragon's head here in progress how big is this section for example I would imagine it is about 90 kgs when it's uh, dismantled. And, you know, like right now, uh, I'm, I'm having this all the time, big pieces, uh, because mm -hmm. you two or three big guys we, will lift it, it will install it. And I mean, I cannot afford to be looking for smaller pieces while designing because uh, I think... Uh, the work will suffer, you know what I mean? If you start subdividing too much, so that's what I'm trying to avoid presently. So these sections are like pieces of a puzzle. That yeah. each section is approximately, well, it would vary, but this one you, you estimate is a 90 kilogram section. Well, let's say this, this is probably 1.2 meters uh, long and 78, whatever, 70 wide, if you can call it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then uh, it fits, like, if you look at all other works, they fit mm -hmm. like a jigsaw puzzle. Yes. And they've, got, uh, they've got about seven millimeter joints in between the segments, which you later on grout, you know? So. 
And the the technique involved here, you know, this is the, there's the conception of the work, you know, that we'll talk in a minute maybe about the motives you're using and the, the imagery that you're using. But it's, you know, I won't say it's similar to sculpture, but there are some similarities. The idea might take, you know, a couple of days, but the actual making, it, it must take, how long does it take you to make one of these particular, a complete work, for example? Well, I mean, we're talking now, I'm, 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 I'm doing the border for Dragon Mosaic right now, which will take me probably another eight, no, sorry, six weeks. So we are talking two, two three meter mosaics directed over, over a year. And there is another one coming and it's, it's a lot of work. It's becoming really physical. So I'm not losing my passion whatsoever, but I'm not killing myself, you know? <laughs> I mean, so th that is a huge difference from now and let's say five years ago, you know? Yes. So. And you, you know, in terms of the um, practicalities of this, you're doing it all yourself. So you've got your, your client liaising, you've got your design um, development, you've got your palette selection, which is, I guess, sim similar across your work. You've got the material selection. Then you've got the form work here. If you look at the, the form work that you've got around these sections, developing the sections, getting the sizing right, you know, bending the, the casing or the wood in to create the form work, laying it in the stone, then you've got to cast the, the piece. So it, do you have a team, John, to help you? No, no, I'm just on my own and it will remain that way. Uh, because, I mean, if you start employing people, uh, delegating your work, I mean, the quality will eventually suffer, you know, so you want to make sure what you want to deliver, you know, and I, I made this decision a long, long time ago. You know, so mm -hmm. that's it. You know, so look at uh, this image that we are talking about. Uh, this is the culmination, if I can call it, my journey. Presently, this lady, its metal frame is being made for her, and she will be erected upright. So that was my 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 biggest dream of my lifetime. You know, to be placing pebble mosaics upright, vertically. Mm -hmm. Into the ground. So, this is probably going to happen at the end of this month, I would assume, you know. And what's the height of this piece, John? Uh, 2.6 meters mm -hmm. high and 1.6 wide. Wow. And so, you're working within that tradition of the pavement mosaics, and we see those pebble mosaics even from Pella and the um, the, the ancient mosaics, but you've developed this in your own way and into. Uh, your own uh, sort of visual language, I think, that it's your your pieces are completely iconic. And we there's no, when we look at your work, we know whose work this is. We're not going, oh, I wonder if that was, the, I wonder, it's like oh, this or it's like that. About this one, because that's a dragon, that, that would say, my God, what is he doing right now? Dragons. <laughs> Oh, but I mean, if you look, sorry for interrupting, no, no. If you look previous works, they're obviously, obviously from New Zealand. They, I mean, that is, uh, there is no, I mean, there is no theme in anywhere in the world like that, right? I'm not trying to say that I'm special. I'm trying to say the themes are special. Yeah. yeah? Well, that, that's right. You've developed this, this series, um, drawing imagery from the, the New Zealand wildlife, flora and fauna, yeah. and uh, absolutely gorgeous. So when you, the, particularly the birds, I really feel the, the birds just speak to me um, in, in, a, in a way that the others, I mean, the, even more. I mean, the symbols and the, the, the sort of emblem I hear is very striking and very strong. But when I see these birds, um, they have such lightness and it, it's like you're creating lightness, but it's such a heavy material. How is, how do you, how does that happen? Even, even this one, you've got the monarch butterfly, even though the material is heavy, it's cast in concrete, it's in the ground, but it still has, under Mento, it still has a lightness to it. Um, and I think that's, that's something that's really, really difficult to achieve. And, I think there's a simplicity as well in your work that 
because you don't have a huge palette of color available to you, you're working with the, the color of the natural stone. You need to really distill that, the motive and the image you're working with down to be really successful in such a, you know, such a limited palette. And, and the, the way you've used, particularly this piece, this is just, this is my favorite. Yeah. Um, when we look at the, the, the back of the bird and you can see the directional laying in the tail, the directional laying in the wings, and then the directional laying in the body, the way it twists and comes around the form. It's all one color. It's all one material, yet through the, the laying on the undermento of the pebbles, you've been able to capture the rhythm and the movement of the bird. Yes, that, that, that is very important. If I can add uh, um, with a primitive language, you can kill a kill a mosaic if you choose the wrong of the mental, you know, how you move stones. And when you do it right, uh, the impact impact is amazing. And especially because um, pebble mosaic always looks different during the day, the way the sun rays fall onto it and so on. So mm -hmm. it is, uh, I, I, get, I get really excited about it. I know I'm biased. Uh, I know that I'm passionate and I want to address another issue what uh, Heather and Vicky were talking about and I want, always wanted to interrupt and say, do you know this Greek saver, Anima Mundi? Anima Mundi, where does the psych stop? Does the psych stop in stones? No, it doesn't. Is the mm -hmm. soul in stones? Of course mm -hmm. there is soul in stones. Mm -hmm. Everything is interconnected mm -hmm. and you can feel this in stones. Okay, we can say now he's gone off his wall, he's starting to imagine things, but that's not the case. Yeah, yeah. They get really warm, you know. Why have you stuck with this material? Why? The, what's what's it? I mean, I know you developed this your business. It, it's a it's a full-time job for you, but you've never been seduced by another material? No. No, I mean, this is getting exciting, more exciting by the day. Uh, uh, especially when I work, you ask me, do you look for special pebbles? No, I don't. But as I start working, uh, Caitlin, I place, I'm looking for a spot and you would not believe I find that stone and I haven't been looking for that pebble at all. Like I'm saying, my God, I mean, I'm not religious, but I said, are you helping me? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's getting outright crazy sometimes. And I want to almost take photos of this to, to, so that people can witness it. But it's just happening all the time. You know, it's not, a, it's not a accidental anymore. So obviously, I guess it's preparation, I would say. Yeah. It's the, it's the again, the distillation of practice. It's your, your you know, distilling in, in the subject matter. You're distilling in the palette. You're distilling in the material. You're distilling in the process. You're refining. So you're so focused. And I think that is one of the, the key elements of today with the speakers that we are talking about is that there, there's so much to know in mosaic and so many ways to express but when you find your particular way your particular material your particular voice and and work hard at distilling that then beautiful things are happening and um your work is just beautiful john and i'm I would love to have one one day. Um, you yeah. know, it, it's just uh, it's something I would love. To, and it must feel good to walk on in bare feet, does it? It is. It is because they're all even, you know what I mean? And uh, very tactile at the same time. So it's a beautiful feeling. And I think uh, they're using more pebbles for other purposes, you know what I mean? Spiritual, uh, whatever, you know. So, yeah, it is a beautiful feeling to walk on those. I imagine it would be. So um, I, I want to thank you, John, for sharing today and for joining us in this in this Sharing Connect. And Can I um, just say something? I just course. say something. Yeah. Uh, and I've, uh, everybody has been talking about it. Um, but here it is. Art, for those who love with their eyes, they say goodbye. And for those who love with their heart and soul, there is no separation.
So this is basically what we are talking about, the anima mundi. Uh, Keda and Vicky were talking about the power of stones. So here you are. So there is no separation when you offer your heart and soul for what you do in what you yeah. yeah. So that's it about it. Yeah. Thank you, John. That's yeah. beautiful. You're you're absolutely spot on. And I think um so I had an experience with Marco De Luca once, and he said to me, um, when mosaic is about the head you're coming from your head it is hard but when the head and the heart and the hands join it is easy and it flows so I think that also connects with with what you're saying and um, I'd like to ask you one final question what is next for you John well I'd like to see more upright uh, installations vertical mm -hmm. installations and that that is uh, but basically basically pretty much what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there is a lot of work in New Zealand. I wanted to go uh, international. Uh, there is a mosaic going to Tucson, Arizona next week. But I mean, uh, I'll, I'll be still doing this stuff. <laughs> more more yeah. I cannot tell you. <laughs> yeah. Life is unpredictable, you know? You can never, you can never predict anything, you know? Indeed, indeed. And uh, we look forward to seeing the development of your of your work. And um, I would also like to ask the same question now, please, to Vicky. What is next for you? Um, for me, um, more time back in the studio. I've had a little bit of, you know, sort of busy, busy working, uh, working at the hospital. Uh, but I... I'm hoping to be back in the in the studio more. Mm -hmm. I'm working towards my first exhibition, mm -hmm. um, which I'm hoping that will happen next year. Uh, all going well, COVID, etc. Um, but yeah, creating a body of works. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the view from above. Yeah, and I think um, that's a beautiful goal. And we're oh, all, all looking I'm forward excited. to seeing that happen. We'll I've be got, all there. I've got quite a lot of little pieces coming together and um, my next sort of um, thing is to create some bigger pieces, some some larger artworks mm -hmm. um, to go in this series. But, yeah, I am. I'm, I'm really excited about it. Fantastic. I'm, ex I'm excited and inspired after today yeah. and hearing the other presenters and just chatting with people. and. Yeah. Oh my God, my it's, gosh. Uh, it is inspirational and you're yeah. part of that inspiration, Vicky. Oh, and Heather, a question to you, what's next? Uh, similar to Vicky, um, I have a solo show coming up too, which I haven't actually started working on yet, <laughs> but it's 2024. So I keep telling myself I have time. I know it's a fallacy because you don't, because all these things take so long. But yes, I have a nice solo show coming up, which I'm really thrilled about. So in the local gallery here. So that'll keep me busy. Um, I've also got a lot of uh, really exciting teaching this summer. It's like now that COVID is mm -hmm. hopefully passing us, um, everyone is excited to get back into classes again. Mm -hmm. So my summer is very busy, my Northern summer. So excited about that. Beautiful. Looking forward to seeing what you create next. Thank you. Um, now, Saskia, would you like to, um, is there, have there any questions from the participants or any other comments yes, for the answer yes. to our key question? Yes, we do have. So uh, Linda um, um, is asking a, a good question. Um, she would like to know um, if um, Vicky, the, when Vicky works with natural stone, whether the weight of the stone in your pieces, Vicky, ever determine the size or scope of the final product? No, they don't actually. Um, it, funny enough, I don't know. I just sort of look at the stone and go, yep, that'll go there. But I have noticed though, like the smaller the piece, obviously, the, the smaller your stone. Like I try to integrate some big stone, but also more smaller um, pieces. Um, yeah, like sometimes I just look at a big slab of, say, um, 
you know, marble and I think, well, I'm not going to stick the whole piece of marble on there. <laughs> but, you know, I like the variation personally. I like to have some big, some medium and some small. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I often pick up all the little scraps off the floor. I will mm -hmm. sweep them. I will sift them and I will grade them. Because yep. those little tiny pieces, it's not that I, I'm being wasteful. I, it's, uh, it's just about, look, it's ready. It's pre-cut. I can use that again. <laughs> and, you know, you, you sift through and you go, oh, that's the perfect piece. Here you go, you know. But often, um, no, for me, it's the, the size of the stone doesn't, yeah. doesn't determine yeah. my piece. I Thank just. You. <laughs> Thank you, Vicky. Thank you. We, we do have another question from uh, Carol Helmers for John. And Carol is saying, I assume that John grates and store, stores his pebbles in size and color. Can he elaborate on storage of his materials? Uh, I don't store much at all, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so because I just select for every project, uh, I do happen to have some stones that remain from previous projects, but I mean, most of the time, every single segment, selecting stones, bringing home a handful of stones, so there is no storage of them whatsoever. I mean, just a little bit, that's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Thank you, so you, you make probably one of the largest pieces and you have the least material stored. That's quite amazing. No, 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 no. <laughs> no what I'm basically saying, if I like it's working on a dragon, you see the, uh, the green background, I'm not storing stones, I'm uh, working from a segment to segment and for each segment selecting stones, so yeah. bringing home a bag and that's it, you that's know. It. Yeah. Of course, there are some stones there, but uh, not, not, a, not a huge amount. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, we can learn from you. I certainly can <laughs> when it comes to storage. <laughs> when, John, you've said a couple times now that you really want to see your work uh, on a vertical plane. And yeah. I wondered what what is it about that that you know you said that's your dream. So why is that important to you, or what is it about having pebbles on the vertical plane that's important to you? Oh, because because you basically uh, you see the whole mosaic in front of your eyes, whereas when you're looking into the uh, on the ground, you're restricted. Your view is restricted. You know, if you go, you have a mosaic of three meters in diameter, and you have it upright, you see the whole thing. You know, much, much better than when you see it in the in the ground. That's that's the main reason. Mm -hmm. And also it is far, far, far more impressive, I think, if you just have it vertical than rather horizontal. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you. OK, um, I just wanted to close by extending my incredibly um, large uh, love and thanks to my presenters today and for for all the time and effort that you put into um, organizing your imagery and um, preparing for today. Thank you also to Michalina and Saskia for moderating the chat um, and coordinating the questions. And then, of course, thank you to all of you for joining and being a great audience and a participatory audience. And um, I really hope that this morning has given you a spring in your step and uh, some things to think about, some things to look up and keep an eye on Heather and John and Vicky's progress. Um, and we'll see you online sometime soon. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Heather. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank, Thank you all. Great. Thank you. Oh, Bye. Thanks.